everyone to meet your neighbors. Today we have the distinct privilege of being on site at the Shoreline Trolley Museum with Tom Lawrenson. So welcome, Tom. Thank you. We thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. It's a pleasure. Tom, before we even move on to all the fascination that's here on site, um, I'd like to dispel the myth of where this Shoreline Trolley Museum is, because everyone tells us that it's in East Haven. Well, it's in Branford. Right. <laughs> the, the front door is in East Haven, and the little building, the Sprague building, which is our visitor center, that's in East Haven. But just beyond the building is a bridge, and that's the Farm River, which is the boundary between East Haven and Branford. So once you cross that bridge, you're in Branford. And of the property we have here, it's I think it's something like 90 acres, and of those, four or five are in East Haven, and the rest is all Branford. Branford. And in fact, the organization is really the Branford Branford Electric Railway Association. Ah. That's how it started, but we do business as the Shoreline Trolley Museum because that's a little bit more indi indicative uh, of what we do. Um, and the Sprague building, the visitor center, was 10 years after the museum was started. Oh, so it, it was a later addition. I see, I see. So folks, the Trolley Museum is actually in our town, which is quite nice for us. <laughs> so uh, Tom, you volunteer here. So how long have you been doing this? Uh, yes, practically everybody volunteers here. I've been doing it for about three years. Our oldest uh, member goes back to the 1950s. He's okay. been a member that long. Wow, beautiful. So, and what is your function as a member? Uh, I do uh, two or three things. Uh, first, the, the little badge tells you that I'm a, an operator and conductor. So Great. I operate these things, take people down the line, uh, take them through the barns here to show them the cars in the museum's collection. Um, and the conductor part, uh, well, usually we're, we're one man operating, but sometimes we're two, and so one is operating, the other is talking to people. The second thing I do is to run the Speakers Bureau for the oh, Trolley Museum. Beautiful. So I go out to Rotary Clubs, to historical societies, to museums, to anybody that asks, basically, uh, and give talks about the museum. They're all tailored. It's not just a standard you know, talk. Uh, they're all tailored to the particular audience. Yeah. So every one is slightly different, sometimes quite a bit different. Excellent. So, so how many members do you actually have in the association or whatever it's called? We have about a thousand members oh, yeah. uh, and they're oh. spread all over the world. We have, oh. have them in Australia, we have them in England. Oh, my goodness. We had a member uh, who was over in England in London in June and he was doing a talk to some London underground uh, fans and he included a mention about the Shoreline Trolley Museum and three members of the Shoreline Trolley Museum came up to him afterwards. They'd <laughs> seen his talk advertised and come up to him. Wow. Uh, today, uh, we have a father and son team operating. The father comes up from Pennsylvania, the son comes down from Massachusetts, and five times a year they meet here and spend the day operating. Do you think we might get a chance to meet them? Yes, I, I'm sure you will. Okay, <laughs> They're very approachable. <laughs> okay. We also have a, a team who come over, it's two friends who come over from Chicago every summer for 10 days to two weeks, and they spend their time operating these cars. And he wasn't able to come this year, but we did have a gentleman from California who would come over for a, a week or 10 days and operate these cars. Excellent. But uh, apart from those, we have people in Long Island, in New Jersey. Mm. They're pretty widely scattered. I'm one of the most local members. You don't sound overly <laughs> local. Where, where do you hail from? What, what's your roots? Aye, well, I'm Scottish originally. <laughs> Gorgeous. You sound so lovely. <laughs> Thank you. But it's lovely to have you as our neighbor in Branford. Um, so, well, wait. Uh, I heard he's a motorman. He's yeah. a conductor. He's a head of the Speakers Bureau, and he speaks and <laughs> does other things. But what, there are other functions that people do here. Yes. So, I mean... Well, these things don't come brand new. No, they don't. <laughs> uh, they need constant repair. For example, so the paint work every so often just needs to be touched up. You might rub some of the metal down, do up the, the paint work here. Uh, very often the trolleys arrive in pretty poor condition. Oh. Just over here, for example, car 500 is the car that was uh, used by the directors of the company. And this is a luxury car. There were only about three or four of these anywhere. And this one was regularly rented out to other companies to do their inspection tours. The museum obviously wanted it, but they weren't allowed to have 
it until this building went up so that the car could be protected from the elements. But even so, that, you know, although it's in pretty good condition, the door there will need to be re-varnished at some point. Uh, you know, the, the underworks get rusty, the motors every so often need to be taken out. There's a huge amount of work that goes on uh, just restoring the cars. And then there's maintaining these buildings. This building goes back to, you know, 70 years almost. Um, they leak from time to time. Uh, you'd be surprised to know. And we have a workshop in one of the other sheds that takes after this. We have uh, people who look after the buildings. The trees down the line grow and encroach on the line, encroach on the power cable overhead. That needs to be taken care of. We're always having to replace rail tracks and rail ties. Uh, the signals, the trolleys originally didn't have signals. Originally, every motorman had a timetable and a watch. And you had to be at a certain place at a certain time. <laughs> Otherwise, the system fell apart. Nowadays, we use signals. And there's a team that do little else other than take care of the signals. So there's a whole variety of tasks that people do here. What I do is just a sort of front end part of it. Uh, the operators take up about a quarter of the total volunteer time that is put in by our volunteers. There's another quarter that's put into restoring the cars. And all the rest uh, is people who look after the buildings and the grounds and the tracks and the signals who uh, deal with the office, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, we have something, if you add it all up, it comes to something like 19,000 volunteer hours every year. 19,000? Which is about wow. nine full-time equivalent employees. If, you know, if we were to employ people, it would be nine wow. all throughout the year. That's a lot of volunteer time. And again, some of these people come in from Long Island, New Jersey, and other places to spend a weekend here, or two or three days here, or their vacation here. Beautiful. This is uh, an early car, and it's an open car. And clearly this is not the kind of car you would use in the winter, but in the summer, when crowds wanted to go down to the amusement park at Lighthouse Park or at Savin Rock, this was ideal. There are 15 bench seats. Each of them will take about six, so that's 90 people. And then you could get people standing on both of these boards, some on this one, and you'll get about two dozen on this one. Really? And you'll get the same on this one, reaching through to grab something to hang on to. Yeah. And if you add up all of that, you get about 200 people on this. Oh my goodness. Even sometimes sitting on here at the front so that the operator could hardly see through. The trouble is that you couldn't really use this car in the winter. And after various experiments, uh, some companies came up with the idea of detachable panels that you could put on for the winter, but essentially, these cars didn't have a, a very long life. The public loved them because they were air-conditioned au naturel, as it were. But the companies, it didn't make economic sense to have a car that you could use only in the summer. Yeah, so Tom, before we take a ride, this is not going to be the car we go on, folks, but before we take a ride, I'm just curious, do you operate these trolleys in the winter as well? Yes, we do. You yes. do? Okay. Uh, we have one car. This is actually it. Oh. This car here... Oh. There's a trolley coming in for the night. Uh, this is the one that's rented out for parties. Uh, it has a nice wide aisle and we can put tables down the middle. And so we have birthday parties from six-year-olds, three-year-olds actually, to people in their 70s, their 80s. We have wedding receptions. We have retirement parties, just any occasion you can think of. Uh, people bring their own food. Uh, we put tables down the middle and they get a ride down to Short Beach and then we park them somewhere to party. Oh, so nice this is the, the party car. <laughs> wow, party folks, car. you might yeah. want to book it. And people have birthdays and retirements all year round. Wow. We do have, a in one of the other sheds, we have snow plows, uh, so we can clear the snow if we have to. We don't always have to or want to, but when we need to, we can clear the, the tracks. It's a street car plow. Well, it's, uh, we have two. One is, a, is a, a plow with a board that pushes the snow to the side. We also have one that brushes the snow out. Uh, the trouble with a, the kind of plow you see on the road is that it pushes the snow down. And when you have rails, when you have switches where the rails have to separate and meet, that can stop that from happening. Oh. So the brush brushes the, the snow out of that. And so that's, yeah, when the snow is nice and dry and powdery, the brush car is ideal. 
feel. So Tom, as we're going towards the car that we're going to ride on, we're passing another very beautiful looking trolley. Can you tell us what this one is, please? Well, it's not a trolley, it's oh, a subway sorry. car. <laughs> uh, and this one was a PATH car, oh. Port Authority Trans Hudson. And on the morning of September the 11th, 2001, this came up from underneath the Hudson and up underneath the World Trade Center. Oh. It was a woman who was driving it, and as she pulled in, she heard on her radio that there was a fire, so she evacuated the train and they evacuated the station. Oh. The, they all got out of that, but then the towers collapsed and eventually they got back in to check this. We have a photograph from September the 30th showing this car with water up to the floor. Yeah. The back five cars of the seven were destroyed. The second one was damaged. This one didn't have a mark on it. Whoa. So it was decided that it was a survivor and that it should be rescued. Oh. So eventually as the rubble cleared, this was taken out of the rubble and stored out at Kennedy in an aircraft hangar. And it languished there for some years because nobody knew what to do with it, but eventually they designed the memorial. And the memorial has a big mural, and this car was supposed to sit at the foot of the oh, mural. Was it? The problem is they forgot to design a way of getting the car oh, into okay. the building. Oh. So it spent some more time out at Kennedy, and eventually it was decided to bring it here. And it arrived here just three years ago. Okay. At the moment, we have it, we have it on display, but it's not terribly well displayed. We we don't have any plans to restore the motors and run it. It'll be a static display. Uh, our time has largely been taken up by restoring cars that were damaged by Hurricanes Irene and then Sandy. So there hasn't been time to look at even thinking about repairing this, uh, even if we wanted to. So maybe down the road? Well, maybe. we can move it and that's all we need to do. Uh, I don't think we want to run that as a car. I think mm -hmm. that would be a sensitive topic. Okay. Well, Tom, I'm, I'm I'm curious about what we have here. Well, we mentioned that we run all the year round and we can clear the track of snow if we need to. And this is one of the tools that allows us to do that. This is a car from Canada and it has a brush there that will brush the snow off the track and brush it off to the side. Uh, really useful because where we have switches, where switches have to open or close, if we push the snow down that can stop that from happening. The brush clears the space quite nicely. This car comes from Toronto and it was used in, in Toronto until the 1960s and before giving it to us they fully refurbished it wow. for us which was very generous. Generous of them. Oh, yeah. This car is from Atlanta, but you remember cars from Brooklyn? Yeah, when I lived in New York City as a, a youngster, uh, we traveled a lot on the streetcars, uh, and there were many lines, quite a few. And um, one of the main end lines was uh, at Coney Island. And uh, they'd have many tracks leading into there from all these different directions, from the Coney Island Avenue line, the uh, Brighton Beach, the, the, all these different locations. And uh, what would happen is then uh, people coming off the beaches at the end of the day would flock to their streetcar line and they'd be lined up the streetcars would come in at each station in that barn this enormous building and then uh, they'd get their fares out and when they stepped up onto the trolley that pulled up next to them they'd get ready for their ride home and it was a long ride maybe uh, four or five miles to get home uh, and you'd uh, ride in the streets Un it actually ran under the elevated trains uh, in most cases and uh, the automobiles would be riding in the streets trucks all riding in the streets uh, the trolley would kind of get in their way they get in the trolley's way they go into one extra lane it was a little tough sometimes negotiating but it all worked out it worked well there's, nice. there's one little addition to that story, which is that the Brooklyn trolleys were an early version and they just had a little gate that you opened to get on and off. As trolleys developed, they developed doors that had to be shut, like this one. The doors have to be shut before it can move. It's yeah. a safety feature. Yeah. Well, these Brooklyn trolleys, this little gate 
opened and shut any time you liked, moving or not. So it was easy for somebody to spot the conductor coming and just jump off and uh, dodge paying the, the fare. fare. Hence the term, the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> well. So, Tom, would you be able to take us on a trolley ride? Certainly. Yeah, ah, we excellent. can do that. So, let's get on board, okay? Okay. So folks, we are now on a standard Connecticut car, right Tom? Yes, and this one was built specifically for this line. Oh. The uh, entrance is fairly narrow and the steps are quite steep, so it really wasn't any good for cities where you want to get a lot of people on and off Quickly. in a hurry. So this is exactly what this is for. Uh, this car was built for this line in particular, so it's perfectly at home. The line was built in 1900, this car was built in 1904, or maybe five, and the line stopped being a commercial line in 1947, but it closed on one one day and the following day the museum took over. So this line has been in continuous operation since 1900. <laughs> Another thing I realized that with these cars with the very steep steps, so people who are elderly or disabled could not ride them, correct? No, but back in you know the first half of the 20th century that does not seem to have been a big problem. Mm -hmm. uh, people seem to have been able to get on and off these things without too much trouble. Yeah. And if you look at old uh, footage of life in the street in those days, people were walking everywhere. That's the streets true. were crowded. Everybody was walking around. Everybody was possibly a bit fitter than they are now. Mm -hmm. And they didn't live as long either, so they were younger maybe. That's true, yeah. That's part yeah. of it. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take this wonderfully interesting, lovely ride to Three. Short Beach, right? We. Oh. <laughs> well, okay. Perhaps on the we'll point out some points of interest and um, we'll just learn something along the way. Who knows? That'd be great. We'll see this next okay. time. six osprey nests down the line and people are usually quite interested to see them. It's high tide, it's close to high tide just now and when the tide is high that's when they tend to fish because dinner is on the doorstep. Uh, at low tide they tend to go out to Long Island Sound and the other thing is that they very often perch on the posts that support our 600 volt line. Mm -hmm. So you come down the line and you see a bird sitting on the, port, the post and it flies away when we get close. Apart from one, there's one that actually stays there and doesn't mind. Really? But the rest will dive off the post and they'll, in order to get flying speed, they drop down and very often they're right in front of you or they'll fly past us. Mm -hmm. So often from the trolleys we're getting as close a view of an osprey as oh, you could ever expect oh, to get. Okay. And if you've walked this, uh, a lot of people in Branford will have walked down the trolley trail. Short Beach people use it a lot, but this is also a section eight of the Branford trails, which go around the perimeter of Branford. So if you're one of the people who've done all eight sections of the Branford trails, you'll be familiar with this. It starts uh, in Dominican Road, goes up Beacon Hill, uh, drops down to the trolley trail just around the corner here, goes to Short Beach along uh, Double, not Double Beach, Short Beach Road, and eventually to the point at the south side, well, the west side of the Branford River. Right. So that's trail number eight of the Branford Trails. Wow. 
Well, this is the quarry trestle, and there's the compressor going again. But the uh, quarry is just behind, just over there behind these trees. Don't see it too well at this time of year. But the quarry had a little narrow gauge rail line that ran down here to the river to a crushing plant where they crushed the rock to to use for things like ballast for railroads and for uh, ordinary roads and so on. The quarry was 1860, so when the trolley line came here in 1900, it had, to, it had to go up and over. And beside us, we can see one of the cars that the quarry used to take the stone down to the river, to the farm river. And much of the stone from this quarry is underneath the Statue of Liberty. They used it to reclaim that island and make it bigger in order to accommodate the Statue of Liberty. The cut stone, of course, comes from the other end of Branford, the Stony Creek end. Oh, I remember. Bedloe's Island, that's what it was. Was it? Bedloe. Oh, I didn't know that. I shall have yeah. to note yeah. that down. Oh, yeah. I mentioned uh, trail number eight, and you can see the trail markers on the tree there. That's telling people coming up oh, the yeah. trolley uh, line to turn right here and go up onto Beacon Hill if they're going that way. Yeah. Or if they're coming off Beacon Hill, they can see the markers. There's one on the post there uh, to allow them to carry on down that way. And in fact, when the trolley line was operational, people from the other side of the river would cross the old sluice gate and walk along this old line. And this was a trolley stop. So if you lived over there, this was the way that you got in and out of New Haven or in and out of Branford. How many miles are we going? The length of line that we have here is uh, about one and a half miles. And how, what's the speed? Well, these are very old yeah. vehicles, so we don't go to full speed. We're probably the fastest we ever go is about 15 miles an hour, 15. partly because we want people to enjoy the ride and see the scenery. I mean, there's no, there's no need to hurry. Right. And we have to look after these uh, vehicles, their, their history. I mean, if, the, if this dates from 1904, 1905, would you go up in an aircraft that was built in 1904 or 1905. Uh, if you can find an automobile that dates from that age, you probably wouldn't even be allowed to touch it, never mind go on it. There are a few ships, you go out to Mystic, you'll find a few ships that are of that vintage. But uh, here's a trolley. There are very few trains, you know, locomotives uh, from that era. But what about in its time? What would be the speed in its era? We have a photograph from the 1930s of a race between a trolley car and an aircraft and the trolley car was winning. Mind you, it was an old biplane and they couldn't go very fast and it was probably into the wind. But uh, I think that the most they would usually do 60, but that wasn't the point. The, the speed really didn't matter because you weren't doing a great distance between stops. You were doing stops every couple of hundred meters, well, a couple of hundred yards down the road. So it was the acceleration and the electric motors meant that you could pick up speed quickly and stop quickly. Uh, steam trains, on the other hand, with their extra weight, they're designed to go a long distance before stopping. They take a long time to stop, they take a long time to get going. Electric vehicles don't. I see, yeah. A question? I think there's a question. Yes. How do the trolleys move? Electric motors under the floor. There are four electric motors on this. They get the power from up above on the pole. The power comes down through something here that feeds more and more power to the motors so that you go faster and faster. And there are four motors, one for each axle. And of course, because they're electric, you can reverse them. The engine in an automobile can't reverse. The vehicle can, but to make it go backwards, you have to have a big, expensive set of gears. On this, all you do is turn the switch the other way and it goes the other way so it's a much and, that, and that's why electric cars are coming back mm -hmm. teslas yeah. don't have all the expensive stuff that a, an ordinary automobile has to measure the fuel measure the air going into the engine and it doesn't have the expensive gearbox and all the rest of it that a conventional car does so their weight is battery space and you can put that right down low and they can go forwards and backwards very very easily and what's your name? Justin. 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 And how old are you? Five. And where do you live, Justin? Um, that's old. Pretty East. And it's very East Jeff. <laughs> Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Well, it's well, great to have you on the ride with us. And when we get going, Questions. you'll hear, if you listen carefully, you'll hear the electric motors. 
and you'll hear them picking up speed as we go. Down in the distance, you see the, the road bridge? Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. bridge over the Farm River mm -hmm. uh, and right beside the original Nelly Greens. Oh. And oh. the grandfather of that bridge is the reason this track still exists. Really? The reason for that is that uh, by the 1930s, trolleys were going out of fashion and so companies were closing them down. But the law said you couldn't close down a trolley line unless you provided a bus alternative on that route oh. so that people would, would still be able to travel. Uh, so clearly there's no road alternative here. There, there's nothing here but the trolley line. The road alternative would have been down Hemingway in East Haven and then along here, along 142 to and over the bridge at the Farm River. But the bridge wouldn't take the weight of a bus. So the trolley company, the Connecticut company, had to wait until the bridge was replaced before they could put a bus service on mm -hmm. and close this line. Well, they were ready to do that in the late 1930s, but World War II loomed and then broke out and you couldn't get steel. And so it was after the war before they could get the steel. Well, they didn't have to do it before the county could uh, get the steel and the bridge could be replaced to take buses and the line could be closed. Mm -hmm. But knowing that all this was going to happen, there were three men in Branford who got got together, raised the money and wow. formed the museum. And they were able to buy most of the land up and down the line and the line and the track. Uh, and they were able to acquire some trolley cars and have them stored away here and there by the Connecticut company until such time as everything closed down. Mm -hmm. So that's why on a particular day, the trolley line closed as a commercial operation. The next day it was opened as a museum. Yeah. And it's all down or largely down to the ground father of that bridge. Wow. Hmm. So you didn't know that bridges were so influential, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is where we do the operation of changing the poles. Do you want to come out and sure. have a look at that? This is the overhead line that carries 600 volts of power. And in order to connect to that, we have to hook this trolley onto the wire. And, th yeah. and this is like a seatbelt thing. This uh, locks if the pole goes too high. If it comes off the wire and goes up, then it locks the way a seatbelt does. And we now have a trolley pole up at the front end. We have to take that one down. Do you want to try taking it down? Sure. <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> Uh, try to step on the wood rather than on the metal. Let me hold your script for you. Thank you. Oh, I'll just put it there. Now, there's a powerful spring that pushes this up, so you're pulling against a spring. So let me get you some slack. I know! Yeah, so pull it down. And pull it to that side. Down, down, keep coming down. A bit more over. <laughs> Is it stuck? That, okay, there you are. Now pull it, pull it to the right. To the left, sorry. <laughs> left. Is that it? <laughs> that's it? Let it up gently. Let it up. And that's it under a hook. No, it didn't. It didn't? It missed. Okay, let's try again. Got to get it down. <laughs> and over. And are we under this time? Is it? That sounds no. as if it's there, <laughs> under the hook. And? I, th I think we're there, right? Oh, you are? So now to make sure it doesn't yeah, detach and go anywhere. Yeah, you can let go. We just wrap it around here. Oh, that was 
Okay, and there's a that hook is not just a hook to store the pole. That hook operates a switch, and that means that this is the end that will control the trolley. Okay. If that wasn't in its hook, this end, the controls at this end wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a sort of oh. safety mechanism involved in the poles. Good. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that. Thank yeah. you. Folks, we're hearing thunder, so we really got to rush back. Come on, let's go quickly now. So this is an interesting, uh, an interesting duo of trolley um, train conductors. It's a father and son. That's true. Um, so this is Fred. Yep. And Calvin. Yep. And Calvin, you live where? Reading, Pennsylvania. Ah, and, and I'm Fred? in Ashburnham, Massachusetts. So how do you make this work? Uh, how often do you come? And uh, how do you make it work together? What do you? What? Generally five times a season. <laughs> yeah. Five times a season. Yeah, pretty much every two or three weeks we're here. And it's fabulous. I come down and, and he comes up to Pennsylvania. And we meet so here beautiful. In the, and how long have you been doing this, Calvin? Here about three years, but I started running trolleys at Trolley Museums in 1970. Whoa, so where? Which trolley? Rock Hill Furnace, Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. Also Scranton. Oh, in Scranton, okay. <laughs> That's more recent. And how about you, Fred? Well, I grew up around trolleys because of him, so <laughs> I was a teenager selling tickets and then con oh. conducting when I got to be 16. Uh, that was all fun. So in the 70s, and then he got me back into this maybe three years ago here. Beautiful. So, well, yeah. we're delighted to have you here yes, in glad Brantford, to be here. and thank you for taking the time to oh. talk with oh, us. Oh, thank You're you. Welcome. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Tom, that was such a fascinating ride. We thank you so, so much. Oh, you're welcome. Do you, do you ever pick up passengers on the route? Yeah. Sometimes. Uh, we tend to occasionally give people from Short Beach who are out for a walk if they get caught in the rain. We'll stop and give them a lift back That's down to nice. Short Beach. <laughs> And uh, sometimes we get people who come from here at Sprague, they go down the line to the picnic grove or down to the quarry trestle in the old crushing plant for a, a picnic or a barbecue. They take one of these foil portable barbecue things with them. Um, yeah, and sometimes just people who are out for a walk and don't realize it's an active trolley line. Oh, Occasionally yeah. we get a tourist who's Ooh. so surprised. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come from? And um, Tom, do you think this mode of transportation will ever make a comeback in cities around the world? Well, it hasn't gone away in many cities around the world. Like, uh, where are we talking lots about? Lots of European cities, Strasbourg, for example, where they have the European Court of uh, Human Rights, I think it is, and the, the European Parliament. They have an excellent uh, trolley system. Uh, Seattle has just put in the South Lake Union trolley, thanks to Paul Allen's money. Oh. Portland, 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 has. Portland has one. It's a light rail and yeah. trolley. Yeah. Uh, but lots of cities have them. Cincinnati just uh, rebuilt its trolley system a few years ago. So in many places, it never went away. Yes. And the Chinese are now developing a system where you don't have to put in tracks in the street. Wow. It's, uh, it runs on rubber tires, wow. and it follows a cable that is buried just under the surface of the road. So it follows that route. And there's one version that, that operates on batteries and it simply plugs in at each end of the line and recharges. Mm -hmm. It takes about 10 minutes to recharge and then it goes back through the city to the other end and recharges there. Mm -hmm. They have another one that's a kind of a hybrid that uh, runs off batteries through the city centre and then picks up power. There's an overhead line once you get it into the suburbs and it picks up power and as it's picking up its motive power it's also using that to recharge the batteries. Mm -hmm. So it goes to the end, changes poles, come back. By that time it's got enough battery power to go through the city center yeah. and there are there are lots of places where that is done uh, from solar cells the power is from solar cells the Netherlands for example uses solar energy for all of its trains wow. mind you the Netherlands isn't a big Wonder. country so the trains don't go very far yeah. and just to wave my own flag for a moment Scotland is now producing twice as much energy as it needs from wind farms Yay. so it's all Wonderful. there yeah. it can be done That's of course it can be done it's, yes. it's, being, it's already being done. It yeah. needs to be done right here. 
Well, uh, if you use this uh, Chinese example, we, all you have to do is bury a cable in the street. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you've got vehicles that are clean, that are quiet, yes. that carry a lot more people than buses. Yes. So, and it yep. gets us away and, from and buses. following oh. electronically, it's not like the cable car system in San Francisco. No, it's simply sensing the cable and following where that cable goes. And so it's quite easy to uh, put in new cables to serve new routes. That was the big problem in New Haven, for example, that if you wanted a new route, you had to lay all that track and put in all the overhead cable. Now you don't. Yeah, um, on another um, track, on another thought, um, what are some of the events that happen here at the Shoreline Trolley Museum? Well, you just happen to be standing ah, in front of uh, <laughs> the event schedule. Okay. Uh, we have a whole range throughout the year. Uh, we have the Easter Bunny at Easter, obviously. Uh, we have uh, the summer uh, regular uh, schedule, for mainly for tourists, but we serve bus companies all year round. Uh, maybe not quite all year round, but certainly for much of the year, tour companies take people on a tour that goes to Stony Creek in the morning for the Thimble Island cruise, and then they come here for a, a tour here in the afternoon. Uh, we have, uh, we're working on, uh, for this year, it's, a, what's it called again, George something, it's a cartoon character that oh. apparently the tiny kids love, and I'm, I'm too old to know about. <laughs> but uh, that's coming up. And then we have the uh, Haunted Isle program throughout October, and then Sand in December. Love There's a whole range of things and one of these leaflets, it's all actually all online, but one of these leaflets carries all the details and they're here in the Sprague Visitor Centre. So if people just go online um, yep, it's to all the there. Shoreline Trolley Museum, yep. you will find all the events that are happening throughout the year. Shorelinetrolley.org. That's all you have to do and then join Tom on a wonderful ride. Or one of my colleagues. Or one of your colleagues, right. So again, Tom Tom, we thank you so much. Yes. And we thank you all for joining us today on Meet Your Neighbors. So take care, happy, happy travels, and we'll see you again. Bye-bye now.